Hello, welcome to Eureka Nerd. I'm Will, aka Calart's Long Claude Shrew. And I am Leah, a common buzzard. Why these things? You'll find out in about three stories' time. But first, quite an interesting piece from Cardiff, a nice local story for us here in Bristol, where researchers have found a way, they believe, to stop tidal waves and tsunamis in their tracks using, well, big bloody speakers. The proposal from Cardiff University School of Mathematics suggests using acoustic gravity waves to neutralise and disperse the energy in a tsunami before it can make landfall. Which I'm almost sure is a skill I learned in the last Mass Effect game. If not, it's probably a skill you learnt while playing the tuba. Also that, acoustic gravity waves just sound very sci-fi, and they sound just sci-fi enough to maybe stop a tsunami. And Dr. Usama Kadri from Cardiff University's School of Mathematics says that within the last two decades, tsunamis have been responsible for the loss of almost half a million lives, widespread, long-lasting destruction, profound environmental effects, and global financial crisis. Obviously, the most memorable one in living memory would be the uh, Boxing Day tsunami in 2004, which I know we covered extensively in geography, because I was studying that at the time, because it was... Massive. And with increasingly volatile climates and ocean levels on the rise as it is, it seems like that's something that's not going away anytime soon. Yeah, we just want to not let earthquakes fuck things up any more than they already do. And how can we stop that? Well, a characteristic of a tsunami is a big bloody wave. How can you combat that? But with big bloody sound waves, acoustic gravity waves. Now these are already a phenomenon that is found in the oceans. They can measure tens or even hundreds of kilometres in length and are probably one of the ways in which plankton, the microscopic flora and fauna of the ocean, move themselves around. The idea is to use AGWs, these ground waves, to almost cancel out the wave propagated by the earthquake which generates a tsunami. It's kind of like uh, if you've ever done any acoustics where you put two opposing sound waves, they cancel out each other. Apparently it's used in airplanes a lot to cancel out the engine noises, they play it back at an inverted frequency and it neutralises in the middle. A little acoustic fact for you there, which is why also if you stand closer or further away from speakers, the noise that they're playing will get louder and then quieter and then louder again if you're standing between the wave. Which is all well and good if you're just out for a rave, but using it to cancel out tsunamis is almost a better use of your time. Dr. Kadri has conceded that we don't quite have the necessary equipment for this yet, but it's probably something that lots of people are going to start looking into after the Boxing Day tsunami and uh, the issues with Fukushima nuclear plant. Of course, to generate the kind of waves that you need, like the Magnitude 9 earthquake from 2004, uh, released as much surface energy as uh, 1,500 times that of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima. So to cancel out that wave, you're going to need an equal amount of energy. Which leads to the conspiracy theory of putting atomic bombs on fault lines to generate tidal waves, which is a genuine thing. Don't look it up, it'll make you sad, but... <laughs> it's a fear. People have that fear that the government is doing that, despite the fact that it would take, thou it would take every nuclear bomb in well, the American I'm, arsenal. I mean, I'd be, I'd be more interested in the, uh, the dastardly things the government are actually doing, but... Um, we're looking at you, chemtrails. It... No, no, we're not. We already discussed this. They don't exist. Oh, yeah. Moving on from... Acoustic gravity waves to sound waves, songs, music. Here in our flat, we're constantly singing songs, mostly the Hamilton soundtrack. And the Moana soundtrack recently, Le Mama Miranda has had some impact on our lives. And indeed, what might have a big effect on how musical you are, on how early you become aware of music, might have something to do with the language you speak. Specifically, Mandarin Chinese and children who learn it as a native tongue, or young children between the ages of three and five, are much better than purely English-speaking counterparts at processing musical pitch. Now, this should be unsurprising if you know anything about Mandarin as a language, because of the way that pitch and intonation make a huge difference on the meaning of the actual word you speak, to the point where I think it's embarrassingly easy for non-native speakers to communicate catastrophically badly. 
They give the example of the syllable ma in Mandarin can mean mother, horse, hemp, and scold, depending on the pitch and how it's spoken. Kind of like going great and great, which is... Only more so. There's no difference there between, for example, great and antelope. It's a, there's a lot more finesse in it. I think this is one of the reasons that a lot of Chinese humour relies on puns, because there's so many options. I remember hearing once upon a time about a poem composed of one word, just one word, at different pitches and intonations. It's all about whales. So, if your primary mode of vocal communication with the people around you relies basically on being able to sing to some extent, to be able to make yourself understood and being able to interpret other people's pitch and intonation to that level of precision, it's not really that surprising that Mandarin-speaking toddlers would have a much better grasp of basic musical principles than, for example, English-speaking toddlers. Just a note that research has come out of the University of California, San Diego. It was published in Developmental Science. And now, from something that makes a lot of sense, if you think about it, to something that makes so much sense you shouldn't have to think about it. I'm just going to quote the title directly here. Researchers list reasons to not lick a toad. Now this is the reason for our animal epithets at the top of the episode. The research is specifically looking at the toxic and potentially medicinal compounds produced by animals of the order Bufonidae, who are toads. And one notable member of this order is Bufo Bufo, the common toad, the kind you might find in your garden, you know, green and warty. So our animal epithets were also tautologically named. So you heard me introduce myself as Kellart's long-clawed shrew, aka Feroculus Feroculus. And my common buzzard is Buteo Buteo. Other fun tautonym names include Hulok Hulok, or the Western Hulok Gibbon, and Myos Palax Myos Palax, the Siberian Zokor, a name which gives away nothing. We uh, looked up a list of these the other night when we were researching, just because it's great fun. But anyway, toads. Bison, bison. Anyway, toads. Gorilla, gorilla. <laughs> Stop. Gulo, gulo. Anyway, toads. Why would you lick a toad is probably the main question. It should be the only question in regards to this science. Why lick toads? Except that as a species, humanity has got a habit of trying anything to try and get off our faces and it turns out licking toads is one of the many ways we have discovered. Mushrooms I can understand, plants I can understand, but toads? I think toads? If you've seen your dog go weird after chewing on one once, or you grabbed one and then put your fingers in your mouth and had a really exciting trip, I can see how it would catch on. Humans and getting off our faces, it's a thing. But seeing as there are many other toads where if your dog chews on them, the dog dies. If you put your fingers in your mouth after handling them, you die. There's a lot more deadly toads out there. I mean, not in our backyard for sure, but still, that is... Not a 0% chance that the toad you could be licking will kill you. And that's why it's useful that these researchers have meticulously listed all the many exciting psychoactive compounds. They reckon 47 frog and toad species are used in traditional medicine. 15 of those belong to family Bufonidae. The remedies that this traditional medicine has employed them for have included infections, bites, cancer, heart disorders, hemorrhages, allergies, inflammation, pain, and even AIDS. I'm still going to come back to this quote from Candelario Rodriguez, researcher at Indica Sat and first author of the review, toxins from a single frog skin can kill 100 to 1,000 mice. The mechanism of action is to reduce cardiac rhythm. It affects your heart rate, which to me sounds like a great way of dying. But some of these compounds are actually useful in the treatment of cancer. They can be employed for chemotherapy. And also a vast number of these species are very threatened. There's um, the created fungal disease, which is tearing through amphibian populations even as we speak. There's a lot of work going into trying to prevent it spreading. Well, that's fair, because the only thing that offends me more than the idea of licking a toad is mushrooms. So... I guess I'm on board now. 
a lot of these species don't produce the same compounds when kept in captivity because they're producing them from other plants and animals that they're feeding on. Well, if you're the kind of person that is going to try and categorise toads by lick, then hopefully you're not doing so before the age of 17. Because apparently at the age of 17, your brain is just about adjusted for all manner of things, including pot smoking. I mean, the suggestion isn't so much that you should start smoking marijuana when you turn 17. Calm down, lads. So much as if you're going to do it anyway, which, let's be fair, a lot of people are, then holding off until you're 17 means that the potential damage that could be done to your developing brain is minimised. And this is research coming from the University of Montreal, and author Natalie Castellanos-Ryan, assistant professor in the School of Psychoeducation, notes that these results suggest that, in addition to academic failure, fundamental life skills necessary for problem-solving and daily adaptation may be affected by early cannabis exposure, but that by delaying it till 17, adolescents who start using cannabis perform equally well as adolescents who don't. These tests included a set of cognitive tests looking at high school dropout rates. So adolescents who started smoking at 14 did significantly worse on these tests by the time they were 20 than their peers who didn't smoke and were much more likely to drop out of school. But she does note that you can't tell kids if you smoke cannabis you're going to damage your brain and massively ruin your life. Even though they are, potentially. Potentially, but that... They're finding evidence that there are negative effects related to cannabis use, especially if you start early, so hold off as long as you can. And then, guys, just, you know, have some awareness that the psychoactive substance you are using at any point in your life is going to be having an effect on your brain more long-lasting than you might think. Yeah, the only thing we can really ask of people, because as we discussed a little while ago with the study of use of tanning beds... People will do things regardless of whether they know it's bad for them, but you have to make sure they're making that informed choice. And speaking of informed choices, we're moving on to something that we would like to be more informed about. If you're out there and you're a physicist listening to this, please help us to understand. Because what? This sounds like a story that would come up if you were busy licking toads and doing underage cannabis. I don't know if it counts if if you're underage because I'm 27 now, but the idea holds true. It seems important that you should have done something that's that's in some sense psychedelic before you can even come up with an idea like this. But, you know, the cutting edge of physics is indistinguishable. super weird. Okay, I'm just going to dive right in with the title then. Scientists unveil new form of matter. Time Time crystals. crystals. So this is not the inert sort of crystals you think of, even diamonds, even salt or sugar crystals, where essentially the molecules are holding together in a locked pattern. And these are crystals built to have a structure that repeats in time. It also sounds like a film that the Jim Henson workshop would have been involved in, which would have had a really bleak ending where your parents get turned into coal. Do you, do you not remember that? That film upset me. I mean, Time Bandits, because that yeah. was almost entirely Terry Gilliam. And we can't expect anything sensible of Terry Gilliam. <laughs> no, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> so, yes, let's just power on with the words of Norman Yao. Time crystals repeat in time because they are kicked periodically, sort of like tapping jello repeatedly to get it to jiggle. That quote doesn't make this make any more sense. The big breakthrough, though, is less that these particular crystals repeat in time than that they are the first of a large class of new materials that are intrinsically out of equilibrium. So instead of having a solid crystal rock like a ruby or a diamond, like a fixed lattice that is very strong, very structured, what you get is jello. I hardly understand how this works. I don't at all understand why it's significant. But I'm sure they will find a way to make it useful to me within the next 20 years. So you go ahead, guys. If you're not using it to blow anyone up, I'm cool with it. And on a similar angle, by the time you're done talking about time crystals, someone will have, of course, suggested around the toad circle you're sat in, or however it is you're doing this, that, I mean, 
life could all just be like somebody's dream or something, or like in the ear of a giant, or a hologram. Turns out, that last one, there is observational evidence that our universe could be a vast and complex hologram. This has been found by a UK, Canadian and Italian study into the cosmic microwave background. Now the cosmic microwave background radiation is kind of like, you know, if there's a huge explosion, you get that kind of ringing in your ears. It's that, but for the Big Bang. The concept of a holographic universe, because it's not entirely obvious from the name what that should be, is essentially that all of the information that makes up our three-dimensional reality we exist in, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess four-dimensional if you're including time, because we are still travelling through that, even if we can't... May take that up with time crystals, I don't know. But yeah, the reality we live in may all be encoded on a two-dimensional surface, like the holograms on your credit card or something. At this point, I can already hear Matthew McConaughey from True Detective in my head going, Someone once told me time is a flat circle. I mean, I know that you can make um, holographic lenses, for example. You, you in encode the depth and curvature of a three-dimensional lens onto the two-dimensional thing and it behaves the same way. It's like wearing 3D glasses when you go to the cinema. It's like having a Nintendo 3DS where the picture is just slightly out of alignment enough so then you look at it, your eyes go a little bit cross-eyed and boom, you got 3D. Like that, but for the entire, the entire universe. universe. 2D projecting up into 3D that we experience in 4D on our day-to-day -day lives just going about your business. Of course, since whether the universe is holographic or not has literally no impact on how we will interact with it on a day-to-day -day basis, I, this is probably very interesting and exciting and possibly game-changing if you're a theoretical physicist trying to figure out a unifying theory, trying to make gravitation and quantum mechanics agree with each other on some level, um, but it, it's, it's basically meaningless for normal people. I'm tempted to utter the phrase indistinguishable from magic, but I'm sure if we do, then a physicist will burst in from offshore and start bludgeoning me with a folding chair like in WCW. But, I mean, if a physicist does want to try and help us explain this, because, I mean, you're a biologist, I stopped studying science at A-level, up until the point of telling you to not lick toads, I am not a voice of authority on anything. So, moving on to something that does actually matter for people's very immediate future, and changing the perceptions thereof. You know climate change? That thing that is definitely happening? Pretty much everyone who isn't in the pay of an oil company agrees about, yeah? Well, it turns out that there's lots of people who still view it as a discussion, a theory, that there is some kind of debate in scientific circles. Among them is not the Pope. Yep, he's framed it as a moral issue in his second encyclical. The wider effect of this has been that American Republicans have started to see it the same way. Dr Jonathan P. Schult, Assistant Professor of Communication at Cornell University, says that by framing it as a moral issue, then Republicans are more likely to kind of skew towards a centre political ground addressing the issue, maybe even veering into the liberal sphere, where it's something that needs investment and time because it's not just, well, that's a problem for someone down the line, but oh wait. But even not having, for example, read what Pope Francis has written about climate change, just showing Republican participants a picture of the Pope before asking them their moral opinions about climate change led them to skew more towards considering it an important moral issue and something we should be preventing. I would have loved to have seen those interviews where people are asking, so how do you feel about climate change? Not my problem. What about if I showed you this Pope? Okay, it's a problem, I guess. It's like being warned, ah, we're going to tell your parents. You know, do you want your dad god man to know? I yeah, know, the, the whole point of a Pope is they're infallible, so you can't tell them they're wrong. On the subject of climate change, um, one, of, one of the things that is 
causing a lot of pollution and waste is plastic bags. Well, just all plastic. It's yeah. made of dinosaurs. Yeah, it's a finite resource for a start, which is a problem. There has been discussion about whether we're using plastics responsibly. So putting plastic microbeads in your facial scrub, uh, which then end up in the sea where fish eat them, thinking that they're fish eggs, and end up full of plastic and with no room for actual food, so they die. The sheer process of producing plastics is hugely toxic, produces a lot of greenhouse gases and vile toxins just to make more plastic bags or toys. I mean, plastics are an essential part of modern life. They are intrinsic to just about every facet of society around the globe. don't really have any proper alternatives to them, except there have been developments of uh, vegetable-based plastics, but bioengineers at the University of Nottingham are investigating making bioplastics out of shrimp shells. And this isn't just degradable, which is to say a plastic which then breaks down into small plastics. Because then we end up with the same fish full of plastic problem. But this is something that is going to only end up as fertiliser eventually. It's going to break down into smaller and smaller biological molecules and improve soil, water, animal health. Because it's made of shrimp. Things eat shrimp all the time. Loads of things. Not me. Not a fan. But the authors from the University of Nottingham and academics from Nile University in Egypt note that non-degradable plastic is causing environmental and public health problems in Egypt, including contamination of water supplies, which particularly affects the living conditions of the poor. It's something that's going to really start affecting the world from the bottom up. Yep, any and all issues of climate change and pollution hit the most vulnerable hardest first. You know, the healthy and wealthy are barely going to notice for a very long time. But yes, this is the innovative biopolymer nanocomposite material, which is degradable, affordable, and potentially antimicrobial, which I think is pretty brilliant, uh, is made of chitosan, a man-made polymer derived from chitin, which is what makes up the shells of shrimp and crabs and lots of other invertebrates. The chitosan can be made into a polymer film by the same processes that we use with fossil fuel derived plastics now. It's just the processing to extract the chitin and turn it into a polymer in the first place that's a little bit different. It's already used in pharmaceutical packaging because of its antimicrobial properties. Turning into food packaging because the main extending the lives of food products without possibly using as many preservatives in them is always a good thing. And turn them into shopping bags, then that's a way of dealing with the microplastics problem. And by the time that you've got degradable food packaging carried home in degradable food bags to go into the degradable you, everything gets pretty much zero waste apart from the energy required to make them. And you can all be lovely fertiliser forevermore for other vegetables. As long as it's not mushrooms. The fungus will come for you. You can't stop it. I will launch myself into the sun before a mushroom takes me. I'll take a step to something we can't even segue into cleanly, so I'm not going to try. We're going from shrimp shell shopping bags to one night stands. Ayy. This is a story about regret and the gender differences in how people feel about having had casual sex. This is research coming from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, led by Professor Leif Edward Ottersen Kinnair, who describes that women regret that they agreed to a one-night stand more than men. Men regret passing up the chance more than women. So I'm not saying that there aren't men who regret casual sex, he adds, but it's far more common for women to regret saying yes. Kenner and his colleagues wanted to investigate if the results of a previous American study would be mirrored in Norway, which is a more sexually liberal country, and found that the patterns of results were exactly the same. Now they are explaining this with reference to evolutionary psychology and the concept that as a uterus-bearing person, one has to put much more time and effort into producing the next generation and passing on your genes than a penis-having person. 
the basic idea being that if you've got a penis and testicles, you can get out there and sow those wild oats and your genetic contribution to the next generation can take all of five minutes. But since there's stuff coming out all the time about how all the things that are described as fundamental differences between men and women, the way we think, we act, the way we react to things, the way we feel, there's significant evidence to suggest that that is not in any way biological and then is entirely cultural and psychological. So I'm kind of feeling like going down the evolutionary psychology route might be pointless. Short-sighted? Possibly, yeah. They have mentioned that one of the reasons might be that women are much less likely to have a good time on a one-night stand than a man is. We do get some interesting quotes here from Dr. Buss, one of Dr. Kinnear's colleagues, who notes that many social scientists expect that in sexually egalitarian cultures such as Norway, these sex differences would disappear. They do not. This fact makes the findings on sex differences and sexual regret in modern Norwegian people so fascinating scientifically. I think that whilst Norway could be very sexually egalitarian compared to the United States, which is where they're basing the study off, there is still a culturally ingrained level of yeah. sex shaming, for lack of a better unless word, on women. We, unless we step outside of the Western context, you're probably going to find that's very, very consistent. Um, I can't say for sure, obviously, what you might find elsewhere, but I'd suggest that, for example, in matrilineal cultures you won't necessarily find the same results depending on their, their general attitudes to sex. I mean, those are obviously the cultures who realise that there's not much point passing things down from father to son when you can't really be sure who your dad is. Whereas on the other hand... And there's another quote in this paper that female choice, deciding when, where and with whom to have sex, is perhaps the most fundamental principle of women's sexual psychology, says Dr. Bass. Now, forgive me for asking, but isn't when, where, and with whom to have sex, most of sexual psychology? Pretty much the whole thing. I mean, the exception There's not really of anything... how and what you use, which is kind of how anyway. The only things that doesn't cover is if you're not just putting a penis in a vagina, what are you doing? As I'm sure we all know, there is a wide variety of ways to approach that question. And that you can take up with Google. We're not going to talk about it anymore here. And obviously, of course, it's looking entirely at... Cisgender, men and women, no mention, of course, of trans individuals who may or may not be able to reproduce. You do get another interesting cultural context when you look at, for example, the isolated townships out in Alaska, where the amount of men to women is a much more skewed ratio, and, yeah, polyamory becomes much more of a thing, where a woman will have multiple boyfriends who are like, oh yeah, I'm going to go drop my girlfriend up at her other boyfriend's house, because, yeah... How much does that evolutionary psychology argument stand up when you remember that, anatomically speaking, a human penis is very, very good at scooping out the sperm deposit of the man who was there before you? And now I've had to think about that. Well, moving on from a replication study between America and Norway, we move on to the Reproducibility Project, where they're going through some of the big names in research, cancer research specifically, in trying to reproduce those studies to confirm that what we've based modern medicine on for the last however long is, you know, accurate, true, the best answer we've got given the equipment we've got now. It's kind of surprising that there are this many studies um, that they feel are kind of under-reproduced in this way, being as one of the big principles of the scientific method is that you, you know, repeat your experiments to check your results, to make sure that it's not just a fluke. And from this project, the first five replication studies have been published, conducted by the Science Exchange and the Centre for Open Science. And of these five studies, reproducibility is proving a rougher ride than they would have otherwise hoped. They've found that at least once in all of these papers, a result that was reported in the original study is statistically significant. 
has not been statistically significant in their replication. The teams involved went to do a huge amount of effort to make sure they really were repeating these studies to the letter, doing everything exactly the same. Which does lead to an important point of defence that what you get in the lab on that day can be just a one-off and maybe the reducibility project itself is experiencing these fluke situations. Yeah, there's, there are always variables you can't control. But for a big difference, something that is completely unreproducible given multiple attempts, then that's where you start running into problems. Maybe for example, in one of these, scientists were trying to test how long it took for tumours to grow in mice after mutating a gene. The original paper said they were growing after nine weeks. In the replication, they turned up after just one week. Um, and in another, after following the first experiment as closely as possible, the replication found that untreated tumours made from the same cells as originally used spontaneously shrank by themselves which might have, you know, some implications for whether the stuff that the original experiment was testing was actually working or if the tumours were just limited in their lifespan in the first place. This isn't necessarily to say that anyone's been faking their results. There is a kind of a culture which says that nice, tidy results are much better. So, you know, you might leave out a few things to make your paper look that much tidier or make your more neat and sensible. And in the coverage of this from gizmodo.com, I actually reached out to uh, one of the authors from the studies that was being reproduced, Marina Sirota from California, University of California, San Francisco, who uh, in their email reply to Gizmodo comments that we are truly impressed with how much figure one in the reproducibility paper matches figure 4c in our original paper, demonstrating the key finding that cimetidine has biological effect between saline, a negative control, and doxorubicin, a positive control, and that the p-value, the significance of this experiment, is indeed statistically significant. Because doxorubicin and cimetidine are two things which are part of chemotherapy plans all over the world, they are still being used, they are still effective, Due to a difference in initial independence assumptions and the study purpose, however, our team applied a different mathematical criteria for judging statistical significance of the findings, leading to differing interpretation of the results. This is um, an issue which may well have arisen in the write-up. It's very difficult for other people to reproduce your experiments if you haven't written down absolutely every single teeny tiny thing that you did, which doesn't always happen because scientists are human beings. And that for a mathematical analysis, if you discover something over the course of a study that is significant, but the study isn't powered specifically to look for that significance, and it comes up and is useful and is interesting anyway, then sure. But then if you're reproducing just that one aspect under more scrutiny, looking, the mass behind it is intense. And I've seen people almost go into fistfights at conferences defending or attacking whether or not a study is statistically significant based on how it is powered for evaluation from the study's design from its beginning maybe 10-15 years ago sometimes. Maths is serious business. So after a conga line of borium atoms giving birth to a new form of matter, shrimp tails making new plastic bags, and the Pope watching you, knowing what you've done, We've come to the end of another episode of Eureka Nerd Podcast, but just before we go, we've got time for a few more quick stories, such as Empathetic people experience dogs' expressions more strongly. Dogs are people too, right? That counts. And that children with asthma may be at a higher obesity risk. Possibly because they're not able to participate in as much exercise, like just as a suggestion. So, if you would like to tell us just how wrong we are regarding physics, or just how right we might be that obese people and asthmatic people have a certain Venn diagram between them, then you can get in touch. You can find us on Twitter, at Eureka Nerdcast, or email us, at Eureka Nerdcast at gmail.com. That's Eureka Nerdcast at gmail.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. The whole point of a pope is they're infallible, so you can't tell them they're wrong. That's the point of a pope. Well, that and you have to look at their...
because there was a female pope once. She snuck in. And According ev- to legend, anyway. And I don't think there's like then, historical um, documentation of Pope Joan, but... Lady Popes, if you're out there, let us know. Or any anti-popes. Those are still a thing, I think, that you can be an anti-pope. I think you have to have declared yourself a pope and be excommunicated by another pope. Things got very confusing in the Middle Ages there for a while. If you're a pope in in exile. (laughs) If you are a mini-pope. If you are a pocket pope, please let us know how you would frame this as a moral debate. Uh, Pontiffs and patriarchs in general. um, You don't even have to be Christian. If you're... The bigger the hat, the better, really. Do they, do they have arch rabbis? I don't even know. <laughs> Mega imams. That sounds like a mini boss. <laughs> this isn't even my final form. The hat like expands and there's robot legs coming out of it. Mecha Pope. Giant gurus. If you are a Dark Souls phantom then please let us know your position on climate change. (laughs) Possibly we shouldn't leave that in the main (laughs) If you have kindled the fire that links the worlds of Ariandel, then please (laughs) get back to us. If you are a Prince of Amber, then let us know. If you possess one of the nine nine rings given to human kings, three for the dwarf lords in their sunken halls. I mean, I was going to say, you know... Uh, I wonder what the arch druid thinks about, but I mean, druids in general. If you're not hot on preventing climate change, uh, what's what's your your animistic earth worship even for? Saving Welsh mostly. Romans had to invade Anglesey because the druids were organising Celts to fight back, and if that's not a lesson for what we're going to have to do to root out some of the awful shit that's happening, I don't know what it is. What about that one guy who declared himself Archdruid in, like, 17-something or other, started dressing oh, yeah, in green? Oh, yeah, that Welsh doctor! Exactly! That was fucking wild! Just like, you know what I'm going to do? Cremation! You can't tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's there's been all those uh, pictures floating around of the Satanists protesting Trump. And obviously, while Levian Satanism is essentially a humanist, there's also a lot of theistic witches trying to organise to topple the rise of modern fascism. So. Dark Lord Satan, if you are out there, please get in contact to let us know your views on climate change. You can reach us <laughs> on Twitter at Eureka Nerdcast or through email at Eureka Nerdcast at gmail.com. That's Eureka Nerdcast at gmail.com. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that one, aren't I?